Hello, everyone. Welcome to the MIT Chinese Alumni Group. I'm Wing King Wong, MIT class of 84, president and founder of the group. Today's topic is leadership and influence without authority. We are pleased to present Dr. Xingjing Jia, who is MIT class of 1993, Doctor of Science, Chemical Engineering, MIT class of 1990, Master of Science, Chemical Engineering Practice, and Master of Science, Chemical Engineering. Xing Jing is an Exxon Mobil executive in technology scouting and venture. He spearheaded the development of the largest Exxon Mobil investment in China, the multi-billion dollars petrochemical investment in Guangdong. Xing Jing had also developed and advised on government engagement, including attending high stake meetings with top government leaders, including meeting with Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. Xing Jing will share with us his perspective on the challenges faced by Chinese in corporations and leadership. Xing Jing will speak for about 20 minutes, then address questions from the audience. You may post your questions now in the Q&A box and upvote the questions that you like. And now, here is Xing Jing. But before I start uh, talking about leadership, uh, let me take a moment to, to acknowledge someone in the audience uh, he is uh, not, not only very special to me, but uh, he is one of the true uh, Chinese American leaders for many, many years. Uh, uh, he is uh, Professor James Wei, he might be in the, in the audience. Uh, he was my uh, PhD advisor when I was at MIT 30 years, uh, 30 years ago. He was the, at the time he was the uh, department chair. Then he moved on to, to Princeton, be the Dean of uh, Chemical Engineers, uh, Dean of uh, uh, Princeton Engineer School. Uh, all my journey started uh, with uh, Professor Wei 30 years ago at MIT. Let's all give uh, Professor Wei a virtual uh, applause. Uh, thank you, Professor Wei, if you're there. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, first have a very brief introduction of my journey, including all the uh, fumbles, the stumbles, the mistakes I made uh, uh, over the years. Uh, not that I want to talk about myself, but really demonstrate uh, that leadership development truly is a, is a journey. It's a lifelong journey. Uh, in this journey, we learn, we make mistakes, we reflect, we learn how to be a leader, and uh, everybody's journey will be a little bit different. And here, here's uh, uh, myself. Uh, I was born uh, in the year of uh, early 90. 60s, uh, you know, in China at the time it was uh, the famine year. The fact I was able to survive is, uh, is pretty lucky. A lot of people born in that time actually didn't even survive. Uh, my, my education pretty much overlap uh, with the, all the chaotic year of uh, cultural revolution. You know how much I studied uh, uh, before college. Uh, naturally, when, when the college started to uh, accept the student, I filled my first uh, college exam in, in 77. I had to wait for the next year to go to college, uh, uh, luckily after. Worked for a few years on various uh, different jobs in China. I was able to come to MIT in 1988 uh, uh, in grad, grad school uh, to, to study chemical engineering in 90. Uh, 88. Uh, again, th thanks for uh, pr Professor Wei uh, to, to uh, guide, guide me. I actually was the only Chinese student from China that year, uh, attended the uh, chemical engineer that year. A after finish up uh, at MIT, it was a tough market and uh, I was uh, soundly rejected by both Exxon and Mobile. At the time, uh, those, those are two separate companies. Uh, uh, end up, uh, I worked for a different company called WR Grace, some, uh, some of you might know. Uh, it was an interesting time in Grace, uh, but uh, around the 2000, uh, I was involved with uh, um, uh, venture activity and Grace uh, 
as soon as I got involved, the internet bubble burst and that killed everything. So that's another, uh, you can call it a setback or failure, but uh, I, then I realized uh, I don't really know anything about business. That prompted me to actually thinking about going to business. And then I went to Walton, did, a, did an MBA. By the time I finished MBA, uh, a couple of years after I finished MBA, W.R. Grace went to chapter 11, chapter 11 bankruptcy because uh, uh, asbestos liability. So that's another cur curveball throw at me <laughs> before I uh, finally joined the Exxon Mobil in 2005. Yeah, Exxon Mobil, I uh, progressed in various roles in technology license, sales license, and that's really where I learned uh, uh, a lot about global business because it was a technology license is a global business. And I had to work with uh, um, customers, partners from all over the world that traveled to probably 30, 40 different countries uh, working all over the world. Really, you start to appreciate how different culture uh, work with the different issue research people uh, from all, all over the world that have a different, different way of interacting, different way of working. Uh, that that's a really uh, experience that helped me to develop my leadership in, in a, a very unique uh, setting. About 2017, uh, I, I went to China to start lead this uh, uh, capital investment project in China. Uh, when King uh, mentioned earlier, it was Exxon Mobil's the largest investment in China. And uh, the unique part of that experience is to really help you ap appreciate the difference between Chinese culture and Western culture in terms of both the business environment and how to work with the government, how to work with people. Uh, I'll be uh, very honest with you, there are successes in that experience. There are less successful experience in that part, but in the end, I learned more than, uh, I ever imagined uh, through that experience. Uh, it's uh, in the end of the day, really, this is, I want to mention, this is a, a journey. There are a lot of failure. Korea is never a straight line. You're gonna go through a lot of a zigzag. And the key is every time it doesn't matter, it's a success or it's a failure or whatever it is, you reflect, you learn, you move forward. That, that's really the key. The other th the thing I'll mention is uh, you can tell I could, did a bunch of uh, different things not in the typical business. I'd see take risk. It's usually those unusual assignment that really give you the opportunity to test and to demonstrate your, your leadership. That's something uh, I, I want to share a little bit from that perspective. With, with that, uh, I'm going to start talk about the main topic of tonight about leadership. Uh, if you if you're attending this seminar, obviously you're interested about leadership and wants to be a leader. Uh, if you if you uh, I assume many of you in the in the audience got an MIT degree one way or another, you're smart, you work hard. Uh, does that make you a leader? Maybe maybe not. Uh, it's a uh, uh, being smart and uh, being being work, working hard uh, doesn't necessarily uh, it's it's a sufficient uh, it's necessary but not not sufficient to be a leader. Uh, it's uh, you often hear uh, in the today, especially in the in the corporate world, you need the leadership. But the problem is no one really explained to you what 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 is leadership or what does leadership mean. If you talk to 10 people, you, you end up with 20 different answer. Each book tell you something different about leadership. My reflection is really through, through the, my career is uh, there is not really one definition of leadership. Every, everyone is different. Everybody has to define what their leadership mean. will have a different interpretation of what leadership is or is not. What's really important is that each one of us has to internalize what leadership means for us as an individual. Uh, so I, I, what I'm going to share really is the, my perspective of leadership. It doesn't mean this is uh, the way you should be looking at leadership or anybody else. Yes, I just want, want to share, again, my perspective of uh, what, what, what's important in terms of leadership. The first one I want to share is the leadership is uh, 
about self-awareness awareness versus self-confidence. Many of us, uh, especially early career, when we start our career, you probably hear people talk about feedback, uh, especially as a Chinese American, Asian American, you hear this kind of a feedback uh, all the time. You need to be more uh, outspoken. You need to be more confident. What, what the problem is, uh, it's very hard to think about what, what does it self-confident mean? Does that mean you need to pretend to be something, somebody you're not to be, pretend that you know more than what you actually know? It, it's, uh, the more I think about this, the way I internalize it, really it's not about self-confidence, it's about self-awareness. By self-awareness, uh, I mean four different things. One, you need to know what's your strengths, what's your weaknesses. It's not, it's not always easy. Actually, you know, when, you, when you're trying to think about if you're good, very good at something, if you're naturally good at something, you think it's easy, but that you don't necessarily appreciate that that's actually a strength you have that other people may not have. Especially you, if you attend, attend the MIT, you're probably uh, pretty good at certain things you tend to assume those things come natural to everybody. That's not necessarily true. So know your strengths and know your weaknesses. It's very important. Just knowing is not enough. If you know what your strength is, you need to figure out how to leverage your strengths to grow. Think one more beyond, hey, I'm good at this thing. What does it take, you know, how do I leverage this, my strengths to, to influence, to drive activity, to lead in change, to be very thoughtful about leverage your strengths to grow your career. That, that's one, one step beyond. The other one is your, you know, if you have areas that you think it's a weakness, weakness that you need to improve, try to think about in a way, um, this is also very difficult to, to get a true assessment of your own weakness. If you ask people to feedback, people generally don't tell you honestly. A lot of that time, they don't honestly tell you your weakness. My experience asking people for advices, don't ask for feedbacks. If you ask them for advices, People tend to tell you, hey, you could do this differently. You could do this way or differently. Asking for advice, generally you get a better chance to actually assess what could I have done differently, where I could improve, where I uh, do differently. The last thing about the self-awareness, uh, it's, it's we tend to miss is uh, self-awareness is not just about you know yourself. You have to know how you are being perceived by others. You, you could argue other people's perception may or may not be accurate, may or may not be true, truly reflection of it, reflecting yourself. That actually doesn't matter. Even if the perception is 100% wrong, that still impact how you are being perceived as still impact your effectiveness in the organization. So it's very important to, to try to get a sense of how you are being perceived in the organization so you can be more effective when you interact with the people, when you navigate the organization. So that, that's the full, full aspect of self-awareness I tend to think about it. If you going back to the self-awareness versus the self-confidence, my thinking is uh, if you are self, have a self-awareness, typically you are going to be self-confident. But the other way is not typically true. Means if you are self-confident, doesn't mean you are going to have self-awareness. That that's something to to think about. The more I think, the more you know about yourself, with the more control you have for your career, your life. Uh, that that's how I see one important aspect of leadership is really to step back, uh, reflect, and have a good uh, self-awareness. Uh, I think you are going to be much more confident once you have the self-awareness. You know how want to push back, want to take a strong stand, because if you know you are, you are really confident you are right, you, you are going to be much more assertive, you are going to be much more confident. 
That, that's the first aspect to me about leadership. The second aspect of leadership uh, is, is about, no, I call it a leading, not authority. It's a uh, leadership really is uh, uh, about create a vision, inspire others to do the best that they can to achieve a common objective. Uh, objective. At the same time, you need to give the opportunity for others to learn, to grow, to max their, maximize their potential. It's a, you can tell it's a, there are quite a few elements I throw in their vision, the objective, uh, allow others to grow, a lot of things. But I did not include in one thing is that people tend to think about leadership is managing people. Today, the organization everywhere is getting flat, getting more matrix, getting complicated. Success very often is not defined by how many people you're managing, but it's more about your ability to lead organization change, influence decisions, how to develop a people. Uh, it's a, it's a, this has become a cliche, but uh, no, the, not, not everybody can be a manager, but. I think everybody can be a leader. It's uh, to be effective uh, in, in a matrix organization, you, you have to figure out uh, how to break a barrier, how to remove boundary, how to work with, with the uncertainty. All those things, uh, you do not have to be a manager to be effective in those space. One of the framework I use, uh, I share with a lot of people over the years, is uh, I call it the two, two circle theory of leadership. Uh, I made up this uh, term. It's uh, if you think about the kind of activity you do in, in a, any, any job, including company or whatever you do, typically, you know, if you think mentally, think about a small circle and uh, inside a big circle, typically, whatever inside this circle, it's a uh, it's a clearly it's your job, you know you have to do it. The outside the big circle, typically you know, hey, you're not supposed to do that. That's outside of your realm of uh, responsibility. You're not supposed to do it. It's the in-between space, between, between the small circle and the big circle. That's where actually you can make a difference in terms of your leadership. If you think about it, nobody has told you that's not your job, but nobody has told you that it is your job. It's all up to you to be proactive, take leadership, to push the boundary, to, to make a difference in that, that space. What's interesting is, uh, I think, the, especially in the corporate world, uh, the world is getting more and more uncertain. That space between the small circle and big circle, I think it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. As, the, as you grow in a corporate environment, that space also getting bigger and bigger. So how do you, how do you behave? How do you take leadership in that space really is, is the difference you can make in terms of the whole impact for an you know, organization. One way to, the other way to think about it is uh, since the, in between space, uh, typically nobody tells you what you need to do. Typically, whatever you do in that space, uh, it's uh, your choice. You decided what to do. It's more likely than not, actually, in that space, if you choose to do something, it's more aligned with your skill sets, more aligned with your interest, and more likely you actually enjoy doing those things. So that's where truly you can actually demonstrate your leadership and demonstrate your capability. So that, that's the second aspect of leadership, uh, I, I think. In the last, uh, the third aspect is the leadership, uh, I call the contact and contextual or situational versus universal. For many years, uh, there are a lot of leadership study trying to figure out, hey, what are the three, four, five uh, different uh, skill sets or characters uh, a leader needs to have? To be honest, nobody has to find, find a, a magic formula what, what that is, because every situation is different. Everyone is different. Uh, besides, the world is changing very, very fast. It's very dynamic. For example, when I was in China leading the, you know, the investment project, uh, right in the middle of it, the pandemic happens. Guess what? Uh, rather than trying to negotiate the project, the number one priority, the shift overnight is uh, you need to worry about the 
safety and the health of our employees. So leadership, uh, you have to think, be agile, think about differently when, when the situation change. Instead of working with the government policy, we're trying to understand uh, you know, what, what, what does it take for, for our employee to be safe? It's a completely different issue you are going to be dealing with. I had the, the uh, uh, fortunate opportunity to work with uh, General Stan McChrystal. He was a four-star general, lately the, led the Afghanistan war uh, with the Obama time. And his leadership team uh, do, doing a lot of uh, consulting. You know, what, one of the things I always remember the U.S. military is, is really equipped to deal with the conventional war. When it comes to the fighting the terrorists, require a completely different style of leadership, a completely different way of execution. That's another way to think about it's a, for everywhere in the world, leadership really is a contextual, it's a situational. You can't expect it. You're going to learn, hey, this is how leadership behave, and you're going to stick with it. So with, with that, come back to you know exactly what that, if that's the situation, what what's what does it take to develop a leadership? In my mind, it really is about the, the willingness to learn. Because you can never be prepared for all the situation and have the skill sets to deal with the all the situation. The key really is to be humble and willing to learn. If you're trying to use your experience from a previous situation in a dynamic world, hey, you manage the business in the US, I know what to do, you go to China, the skill sets might be very different. The key is uh, you have to be humble, you have to be willing to learn. The other aspect actually, not just to learn, but you have to be willing to all learn what you learned already, because that creates bias when you're in, uh, in a new environment. So that, that's, uh, that's the three aspect of leadership. I personally, uh, again, I emphasize this is my reflection of uh, leadership. I actually wrote an article in LinkedIn. If anybody interested in going to LinkedIn, poke around on my, my uh, LinkedIn uh, about the three topic. That's the first thing I want to talk about it. The second thing is uh, about uh, inference, inference of the, uh, uh, without authority. All of us probably have had a situation in company that the, your success is dependent on some, somebody else who you have no control, you have no authority at all. Typically, success of those initiatives can really define the company's success or your individual career success. So how do you think about inference? Uh, turns out that Aristotle has developed this framework 2,000 years ago for us. By the way, this is a framework I actually learned. My son, attended, when he was in high school, attended debate team. This is the framework they used and he shared with me. The three Greek logos, ethos, as a pathos. The first one, logos, really is about logic. When you're trying to convince the inference to something, you use facts, you use logic, you use data. And second one is that you are about your credibility, your reputation, whether or not you're trustworthy. The third component is, uh, it's a, typically it's about emotion, but there are a little bit broader than just the emotion, storytelling, metaphor, how do you connect with the people. For people like us uh, from MIT with a technical background, including myself, we very often intuitively focus on the first component, first uh, aspect. Uh, you know, we, when we try to make a case, when you're trying to inference somebody, we typically focus on, hey, facts, the, the logic, the statistic, the data, plot. So that's, that's how we try to inference. It's a, we get frustrated when we see it's so obvious the data is right. Why don't you believe me? Uh, it happens uh, very often. It's for all technical trained people. If you reflect on those experience a little bit, you realize uh, most of the time the fact that the inference was not uh, effective, not because you lack of expertise, not because you lack of logic. Very often it's the lack of uh, credibility in the organization. 
if you are new with the organization, you, if you are early career, or if, if for whatever reason you are perceived to be outside in the organization, doesn't matter how right you are logically, you are not be, going to be able to influence the organization. So how do you how do you, you know, question how do you establish your credibility in an organization? I look at a credibility really as a expertise plus trust. It, it, you typically you already if you're a graduate from MIT, I'm sure you have the expertise to do whatever you need to do. It's the trust level. This is where the complication comes. Uh, trust is a very interesting. I've read read a lot of. Now, you know, this is a complicated subject, but I'll point out the two, two things. One is the trust is very, very different in different culture. For example, people, there are thousands of studies that they see Chinese tend to be more trusting. If you survey, see here, can you trust everybody? About 60% people in China would say yes. In America, typically that number is about 40. In Japan, I think it was like 20 or 30. So you would assume that China is a more trusting uh, society uh, in America, but it's much more complicated than that. that. In, in, in America, I think people tend to trust uh, based on your, your past performance, uh, based on what you did, based on some uh, uh, skill sets or how you perform. In China, tend to be more emotional, you know, whether or not you were friends, that you were, a connection, relationship. It's the relationship and trust is very, very different. If you are trying to interact with the people from a different culture, you have to have the awareness that the, how you establish trust might be different from the other party. If you go to Middle East, for example, it's a very different from the US in terms of how you establish trust and how long does it take actually uh, establish trust. That's one aspect. The other aspect I'll point it out is uh, regardless of what the culture is, uh, I think respect and the transparency always go a long way in terms of establish your credibility and trust. If you're not sure, don't assume we trying to trying to be transparent, uh, transparent, uh, trying to be authentic, that's the best way probably establish credibility. The last item is about uh, really the emotional connection with the people if you're trying to inference. I'll just pick one, one uh, uh, aspect of this. In a business world, uh, everybody is typically busy with the thousands of things to deal with. If you're trying to present a case, trying to inference, you have to figure out the, what's the other side's priority and the focus is. If you don't know what the other side's priority and what they are interested at, you are not going to go very far because you are top shooting in the dark. So it's a very important to spend the time and the effort to figure out what the priority for the other people so you can conscientiously connect with the other person. It's not a manipulation in a way, but it's more for hey, speak the language in a way the other person can resonate, can understand. That's really the more frame the conversation in a way the other party actually, oh, uh -huh, that's what it is, so can, can connect with you. So in the end, it's I put on the bottom, uh, influence really is your expertise plus trust plus your passion. Uh, that, that's not, not my framework, that's Aristotle's framework has been around 2000 years, but I think this is a very effective framework to think about influencing in the organization. Last uh, uh, item I want to talk a little bit about is the making decision. This is especially about technical, making decision for technical people. Uh, technical people, as tech, you know, people trained with a technical background, we tend to think of things differently. I highlighted the five things. Uh, when I say communicate with a purpose, uh, really is in a business setting, we tend to think about the technical aspect of things a lot. When you're trying to communicate, when you're trying to make a decision, think about the, what, what's the business ob objective, or what is the problem you are trying to solve rather than focus on the technology. That usually can influence the organization, help you or help the organization make a decision. 
Second item is uh, perfection. You know, we as technical people tend to go the extra mile, go the as long as we can, try, trying to make a perfection. In the business world, the 80-20 rule generally work much better than perfection. Perfection is the enemy of a good, good enough. So use your judgment, use your 80-20 you know, rule. A lot of the time, good enough is good enough. You don't need to, to go to the perfection to, to have a business solution. Third one is probably on this list is that the one most technical people tend to uh, trip up is uh, for technical problem, very often there is a right or wrong solution. Generally, you're trying to work out to figure out what is that one technical solution. For business problem, most of the time, there is no one unique solution. You can have a five solution, all get to a same, achieve the same objective, or maybe even a different objective in the end. There is no right or wrong. Nobody will be, once you pick one path, once you pick one, one make one decision, there is no way two years back to see, hey, you made the wrong decision. Unlike a technical, you can always go back to the business. It doesn't work that way. Once you recognize that, it's a, it's a, you realize, hey, don't debate if there are three, uh, spend all the time and effort to try and try to figure out which one is the right decision. Make one decision, a quick decision, generally is much better than no decision at all. This is the one technical people always have a trouble to, to make the decision and move on with it. The last two, one is about the working with the uncertainty. I think this is more geared towards, you know, we, you know Chinese background, Asian background, uh, we, we, especially in early Korea, when, when situation, business situation is murky, uh, how do you create the clarity? How do you go to the fundamental and the create the figure out what's the fundamental issue? That's the skill sets you need to learn in the business world to help you to uh, demonstrate your leadership and to drive a decision. Last one is the courage of conviction. This is a the background is a picture I'll share is a, this is an airplane, uh, Korea flight 801 crashed in Guam in uh, August the 6th in, I think it was 97, 220 people died from, from that uh, uh, incident. After the, the, investigate, uh, uh, the investigation report, uh, what, what the highlight in the report is uh, two things. One, the crew had a, outdated fly map, of course, that doesn't help. But more importantly is uh, when the flight crew suggested that the, that the captain didn't realize uh, that this is an outdated fly map, uh, he made a mistake in, in the landing. And the both the, uh, I think it was called the flight officer and the engineer recognized that he made a mistake, but did not, because the captain is at an authority level, the trying to suggest to him uh, rather than taking drastic action, see here, you're wrong. Uh, by the time uh, the, the, I think it was the flight first officer uh, trying to take action, it was uh, six seconds before the incident, it was way too late. So if you believe you're right, uh, you, you need to have the courage of conviction, take action. Of course, not all, all decision are life at death situation, but uh, Every decision has the consequences. So you need to uh, be, be uh, aware of, uh, you know, want to take courage, stand up and uh, make decision. I'm gonna share one more example of uh, uh, decision making. This is an example, you know, so I, I'm sure there are a bunch of people in, uh, in, the, in the audience from MIT Chemical Engineer Department. Uh, you, you probably think uh, Kami is uh, one of the best uh, programming in the world. Uh, Actually, it was not always that way in 19, uh, in the mid 70s when Professor Wei became the department chair. Uh, he, one of the decisions, I think it's a very tough decision at the time, I was not there by the way, but uh, he, he decision he made was, uh, you know, to bring a fresh idea, bring innovation, bring new perspective. Uh, he made a decision that MIT came in with the stop accepting undergraduate own undergraduate to its own graduate program. At the same time, 
its own graduate students would not be able to become its own faculty directly. That was uh, probably a very controversial decision at the time, but it's the tough decision like that actually drive organization change. That's how you create the excellence. That's why MIT Kenny has been, has been at the top uh, uh, since that. That's leadership. Uh, let me close by uh, saying this uh, conversation saying by leadership de development really is a journey. There is no defined goal. Hey, here I, I got it. That's it. It doesn't work that way. It's a journey. On this journey, you are going to stumble. You are going to fumble. You're going to make mistakes. But the, in the end, the key is it uh, doesn't matter what the outcome is with the, each experience that you want to reflect, that you want to learn really. Uh, in the end, the journey is the reward. I, I'll show you, the, the, this is a, a photo I took uh, in the woodland, I like a run. The journey is the reward, That's the career is like that. It's, a, it's not a goal, uh, it's, a, it's a really is a journey. And uh, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. I'll uh, stop here and pass back to uh, Wen King. Uh, for for the conversation about question and uh, answer, if uh, if we have any. Thank you, thinking for an excellent presentation. We have some questions here. The first one is: having a mentor is so important in the corporate world. Could you share your experience both as a mentee and as a mentor? Who was your most important mentor? Besides Dr. Wei, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I I wish uh, I I knew that uh, earlier. I'll use two slightly different words. One is a mentor. One is a sponsor. Uh, this is a terminology uh, com company started to use. Uh, I I over the year I had uh, some uh, uh, informal mentor, but I reach out to uh, informal. Uh, I don't call it a sponsor uh, with a lot of people. Right now, at a stage, I mentor a lot of people, made a career, early career. The few things that I learned is one, uh, sometimes we're hesitant to reach out, be proactive. Uh, my, my experience is most people, uh, I would say 99% of people are more than willing to share their experience uh, as long as their time works, you're proactive reach out people, they are more than happy to, to be your mentor. You, know, you own that relationship, but they do not. So you have to be proactive, uh, schedule time, pick topic. One thing I find effective is if you're gonna schedule a time with a uh, mentor, be prepared, pick a specific topic, a specific issue. Hey, here is what I'm facing. What would you suggest? What are the options? Uh, be specific. Again, you need to take ownership of that relationship for it to work. Thank you. Sponsor Thank you. is a slightly different concept. It's uh, in company, typically, uh, if you sponsor typically a little bit senior manager, sponsor you means uh, they are going to formally advocate for you. Hey, this person has this capability, we should move him to the, or her to a, this role. Oh, that, that's the type of thing. They, they can not just to give you feedback, but more importantly, advocate for you, for your development in the company. Both are very, very important in the company. And who is your most important mentor besides Dr. Wei? <laughs> I, uh, uh, I, I, I probably don't need to name the name, but uh, in, in the company, I actually, you, uh, one, one of my manager, uh, about three years, uh, three, four years, uh, the first of uh, three, four years, he was my manager at uh, ExxonMobil. But over the years, uh, he retired a long time ago, but uh, I still connect with him uh, once in a while, uh, if, if I have a buzz of idea and, uh, uh, just uh, get get uh, some uh, different opinion. He has been very, very instrumental helping my development in ExxonMobil. Great. So the next question is, what is the most difficult decision you've had to make as a leader? Most how difficult. You, yeah. And how did you approach making that decision? How does one balance a tendency to be 
overthinking engineer with gut feelings. <laughs> Over the, yeah, that it's uh, uh, I, I see that uh, that's a, I'll tell you one of the difficult decisions I had to make. Uh, it's uh, uh, I'll share this is a recent, ex recent experience. I was in China for three years uh, trying to develop this uh, uh, investment opportunity in China. Uh, being sitting in China, working on the, the culture issue in China, working with the government try to communicate uh, those differences uh, with the headquarter is a very, very challenging. I, I'm sure anybody worked at, <laughs> in that scenario understand the kind of a challenge. How, how do you, you know, how do you uh, position those, uh, you know, when do you push it? When do you see accept that, hey, you know, I'm not gonna make a difference here. Let's uh, move on to the next subject. Oh, you see, hey, this is a really, critical, I need to find it. Uh, those are very, very uh, difficult decisions uh, in terms of the business side. In terms of, you know, I'll pick another example in terms of personal decision is, uh, uh, I, I changed the job from Grace to, to ExxonMobil around 2005. Uh, I truly enjoyed my, my uh, career in, in Grace. I still have a lot of friends there. It's a, it's a very difficult decision when you're trying to change. It's a really, uh, in the end of the day, uh, it's a, at the point that I felt that I need to have a different uh, setting, different business environment for me to demonstrate my capability, my leadership. Uh, uh, in the end, I th thought that it worked out well. Uh, so change, uh, we all afraid of a change. Change always is hard, but uh, most of the time, change workouts work out better than you think. Oh, good. <laughs> That's good to know. So the next question is, how would you advise us to develop self-awareness over time and get a clear picture on how we are perceived? And then any personal tips or advice that work for you or others around you? I, I had actually had an executive coach work with me on this specific issue. I think a self-awareness for know yourself better, it's mostly reflection. Every time when something, uh, a project or something didn't work out or you had some setback, uh, spend the time to reflect should have a, a done differently. What if I did differently? Not trying to second guessing yourself, but uh, hey, reflect to see was there a different way to deal with this issue? I think over the last few years, I learned that that's a truly a way of uh, getting better self-awareness uh, uh, about you know, what I did well, what I didn't do well. That That's... Uh, in terms of the awareness about perception of yourself by others, that's difficult. I think you, you know, most of the time is when you when you interact with the others, you, uh, you know, some people you can read the body language. <laughs> Other people, it's very difficult to read their body language. So it's a uh, uh, you 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 have to continue to test, to continue to. Uh, engage, be proactive, engage to, to see uh, what, what that dynamic is. Uh, I, I would see for that part, uh, there is not a magical solution. That's one was like a mentor or sponsor really can help. Usually those people are not in the direct reporting line. They can give you better sense of uh, uh, how you are being perceived in the organization or how you, how you should uh, behave or, or do things differently. Okay, thank you. Another audience member um, asked permission to describe your approach as a more collaborative approach than compared to the Steve Jobs approach. Uh, Steve Jobs, who was supposedly more demanding, can you characterize a right time and situation for each of the approaches? I, I would say, uh, again, different, different people will have a different style. Holding people accountable, for holding yourself accountable is important. But 
not everybody is a Steve Job, and not everybody has to behave like a Steve Job. But everybody will have a different style. My my uh, preference or my style generally is, uh, uh, you know, business itself generally is a very competitive uh, in today's uh, world. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, it's a uh, I, my experience, I think most people will agree, is getting ahead by stepping on other people is not the way to make a progress. Uh, the more you work in a business environment, the more you realize that helping other people successful is the best way for you to achieve success. So in that sense, uh, uh, no, do, do not just trying to be successful yourself, but make your team successful, make your teammates successful, your team members successful. That's how you demonstrate leadership. That's how you uh, be successful. Because in the end of the day, nothing we do in a company is an individual contribution. It's everything we do is a teamwork. Unless you have a healthy relationship, a healthy team, you're going to be spending more time to deal with all those issues that are actually working on your job. So in the end of the day, the more successful all the people around you are, the more successful you will be. Thank you so much. I so appreciate your answer to that. And the next question is, what would you advise younger people to approach their future careers in a world where entire in industries, companies can become obsolete all disrupted very quickly. <laughs> uh, good news is, uh, I, oh, I guess you know, I'm not sure it's good news or bad news, but uh, every company will be disrupted and every business will be disrupted. Uh, disrupted. Uh, in the end, every product will be commoditized one way or another. So each every company has to continue to innovate to survive. But today, I believe uh, if I remember right, uh, average life for S&P 500 companies for 17 years. Uh, so uh, it, it's not very long. So don't assume your industry or your company is facing the issue. Every company is facing the issue. If you flip around, think about it as, uh, hey, if uh, change or, or disruption, is that a challenge or is that an opportunity, both for the company or for you as the individual? Uh, I, I think you know if you take that as an opportunity, you uh, you figure out how to how to make change, how to drive uh, uh, progress in the organization. You can view the hate. That's an opportunity for both for the company and myself. Uh, so there is uh, no company is going to be in a comfortable position. Hey, we're going to be here, okay, for the next fifty years. That doesn't exist anymore. No one is safe anymore. <laughs> um, the next question is. Would you suggest to spend more time leveraging and strengthening your strengths or trying to improve your weaknesses? I, uh, it's a, a, an excellent question. That's an excellent question. Uh, you know, there are plenty of books on, on both sides. Uh, my, my sense is that you actually, uh, you need to do both, but actually you should uh, not just to figure out your strengths, but how do you leverage your strengths? It means, uh, the more clear mind you are, hey, here are the three things that I think I really do well. What kind of a position, what kind of a job I could leverage that expertise or leverage that strength to demonstrate my leadership. Have that clarity, I think it's very important. There is a book, I forgot who spoke about leverage your strengths, that, that's the whole book is about. Uh, trying to improve your weakness is hard. I think, it, the, to the key, again, go back to the self-awareness is uh, uh, be aware that's something you're not good at is important. Whether or not you can improve it, I'm not sure. You know, For example, we'll ne never speak English as fluently as somebody else who's grown up here. That's a given. If you focus on that, you're never going to get there. Just to be aware of the fact, hey, I'm not fluent, but that's fine. I can speak Chinese better than them, probably. That, that's enough. Uh, so I guess the, the, the answer, short answer is, I think leverage of strengths is more important than trying to focus on the, the weaknesses. Thank you so much. And the next question is, I wonder what's your hiring philosophy? How do you make a quick call on whether to hire a person? Uh, 
higher person. I did hire quite a few people. Uh, the, the few things that I, I'll mention is uh, uh, I uh, over the year, I, I, I'm i guessing 70, 80% of the people I hired are referred by either referred by somebody or I know them uh, in some context. It's a uh, uh, so, so that I can trust. Skill sets uh, is important, but to have that trust level, uh, this um, person will work uh, it is uh, to, to very, very, very important. It's uh, because uh, I, I look at it this way. Most company, uh, when they hire people, the technical skill sets, if you are from MIT, for example, very rarely you need to think about, hey, do you meet the technical requirement? That's not a question. It's a really, hey, uh, people tend to think about the, the hey, is the fit for the culture or not? Nowadays, more and more people actually have wrote this. Uh, it's uh, I, in, the, in the context of the inclusion and diversity, does this person add to our culture or not? Uh, if we, we are all thinking in one way, uh, bringing something, somebody has a unique, different skill sets and may add to a different aspect of the capability of the team, add to a different way of thinking, that, that's the kind of thing I, I tend to think about it. Nice. So uh, the next question is, I have found that a lot of times as a Chinese American individual, people see me as a technical expert, but not necessarily a leader. Do you have some insights to share on this? Uh, yeah, we, we are, uh, I, I've seen, you know, we are, uh, Pigeonholed into that place very often. It's uh, especially if you have an MIT degree uh, that sometimes become a disadvantage actually <laughs> because uh, you know, they think you can't you can't do technical. They don't think about the uh, other aspect of your your capability and skill. So that that's uh, I I think uh, you know one of my colleague uh, uh, told me you know if uh, uh, if you're not uh, uh, making progress do it do it as uh, twice as good as uh, anybody else uh, in a way that works uh, in other way that's not fair it's uh, you know if you have to do twice as <laughs> better to to get to the same place that means the system is not uh, uh, working fair so go back to some of the earlier comment about the leadership uh, really one of the area i think uh, because of our culture, because of the way we grown up and the way we uh, educated, I, I think uh, figure out how you demonstrate leadership, uh, how you to uh, be proactive, uh, willing to take action. I, there were a few, for example, bias to action. We tend to think a lot about bias to action. Don't, don't think uh, uh, too much. I think, you know, take action is much better than that. Uh, even if it's a wrong, uh, it's much better than not taking action at all. Those are the, the kind of thing you demonstrate leadership but enough time. I think you are going to be uh, perceived as a leader uh, one way or another. It might take longer, but that, that, that's what, uh, what it is. So there is no magic solution. Wow. So what are the ways you use to learn continuously and to improve as a leader? Uh, I, uh, I, I read a lot. I, I read books. Uh, uh, I, uh, one, one thing the last three years I start to do is uh, I start to write. I, I have a leadership blog on my LinkedIn. Every week I write a blog. Uh, uh, I started three years ago for a different reason because I went to China. I want to connect with all the thousands of people. I worked worldwide. But uh, what I find is uh, by reading, by, by writing it, help me to clarify my thinking process. Uh, for example, hey, what is the framework for leadership? What's the framework of inference? Uh, by, you think you understand it until you start writing. Hmm, it's not as clear as I thought. I think it force you to think about it, force you to have the clarity. Uh, that, that's a whole I learned. The, the other way is uh, by writing it, other people share their thoughts. Uh, actually, I learned a lot from other people who share their comments on my blog. Uh, I, I really carefully read it, uh, give a very different perspective. That, that's another way to learn. I read your blog too. 
what were your major hurdles in examples of the in-between space and the in-between times when times looked tough for you? Uh, I assume that the in-between means the circle I was talking about. Yes. <laughs> Someone is paying attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, one, one, one thing you have to be careful when you use the framework I, I portrayed the small circle, the big circle is uh, to have a very transparent relationship with your manager. Some manager uh, okay with you push the boundary and uh, view that's a positive thing, that's leadership, that's wonderful, you get rewarded. Other managers tend to hold things tight. If you push too much, you may get into trouble. So uh, you, you have to, you know, the, the manager is not gonna change for you. You have to adapt it to your management style. So my, I always advise people, when you have a new manager, when you join a new group, always start with a conversation, open conversation. Hey, here is how I worked with my last manager. I have a weekly meeting, or I send email. This is how I uh, communicate. Uh, what's your preference? Uh, what's your style? To have that conversation will really help you to set the expectation in the right place going forward to have an open conversation. This is, you know, uh, if you're trying to push the envelope in the organization, somebody will get be uncomfortable with it. You better have your manager behind you uh, if you're trying to push the boundary. So that, that's, uh, uh, that's the advice. I'm not sure I answered the, the specific question, but that's uh, uh, my take on the question. Talking about transparency, we are going up to the hour. So, um, I you graciously have previously agreed that you will go beyond the one hour if we have lots of good questions, which we do. And for the I'll audience, be happy, happy to stay, happy to be happy to stay and have a more conversation. Great, thank you so much. And for the audience who have to leave, uh, feel free to leave and we will stay for maybe another 20 minutes to answer the rest of the questions and uh, keep the questions coming. They are great questions. So um, prior to that, the other person also had the question of what, do you, what did you do during the in-between time when you're facing some tough time? How do you overcome that and manage? Uh... Uh, how do you manage? Uh, I, uh, again, the, it's, a, it's a, like I said in the first uh, slide, uh, I, I had a lot of setbacks in my career. Uh, most of you, a lot of you from China, you know how it feels when you feel your college exam. I actually feel a lot more than that. I feel my first graduate school uh, exam. I had to work for another year. So uh, it's a, Failure, it's a, it's a part of life. Uh, you, what you'll find is uh, through all the career, uh, you learn a lot more from a failure than success. Uh, it's uh, every time you have a setback, you reflect and you learn. Uh, that's, I think that's how we grow. Yeah, that's, that's actually what makes life more interesting. You have a very positive attitude. Thank you. Very constructive. <laughs> So the next question is, by your observations, do you think that AAPIs in the corporate world in America generally face a glass ceiling whereby they can reach management positions that seldom advance to the highest levels of corporate leadership, such as CEO or board? If so, why does that persist? And do you think it will improve and why? Uh, first of all, let me acknowledge it. You know, if, you, if you look at the corporate world in the last uh, 20, 30 years, I think a tremendous progress has been made. Is it perfect? Of course not. Uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you look at, uh, a, use the context of uh, AAPI, if you look at our India friend, uh, they are making tremendous progress uh, between Microsoft, Google, and all the uh, CEOs, uh, the big, uh, big CEOs uh, in, in America. That's indicative of the progress the society is making. Now you come back uh, 
There is a there is a there was a study actually done by MIT professor Sloan School professor uh, Jackson, I forgot his last name. Uh, uh, he did a study to look at the Eastern Asian versus uh, Southern Asian, basically China, Korea, Japan versus India. Why is that? Uh, there is a disparity there. Uh, the statistics show roughly about three times more CEO level people from a Southern India than the uh, Eastern uh, Asian. Although Eastern Asian population in America is about one and a half uh, time more. So in a way, there is a one to five ratio. When, when he analyzed uh, some of the data Clearly, it's not because of the difference in motivation. It's not because of the difference in, in your skill sets. The other one interesting is, uh, is that the conclusion from the study is that it's not because of prejudice. Actually, South, South Asian face more prejudice in, in America than East Asia. That, that's a very interesting study. If you, if you Google it, you'll find it. What he concluded was, uh, again, this is a his study. Uh, you, you have to uh, just, uh, it's one study. He concluded it's not because of prejudice, but because uh, the, uh, the difference, the main difference is assertiveness. So go back to my earlier comment about the self-awareness. The more you are self-aware, the more uh, confident you are, uh, it's uh, somewhat connected with that conversation, but I thought uh, I shared that uh, uh, study uh, with you. It, it help you to think about the context. Again, I think we have to recognize uh, uh, tremendous progress that has to be made. Uh, you know, whether or not it's, it's there, obviously not. Uh, but you know, while we work within the system or, or trying to uh, change the cooperation, but also reflect the why is that the difference uh, ourselves? Yeah, is there something in our culture that we should unlearn or improve upon? I uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, that's some of the thing. Uh, I I think the, what the comment from that study uh, was. Uh, I think if I remember right, the study said, hey. Uh, Southern Asian tend to be more assertive than people from Eastern Asia. American society, especially corporate, uh, recognize assertive as an important part of a leadership. Again, it's one study, don't read too much into it. It's a reflection of the kind of thing we behave because of our culture uh, versus the expectation in American society. It's not, there are misalignment and not, not always the same. I look at this a little bit in a different perspective is uh, we are who we are. I'm not gonna change who I am, uh, but you need to recognize what this is society or what the corporate world values so that you recognize uh, those disconnect. You don't necessarily need to change who you are or how you behave, but if you know, hey, there is a connect disconnect here, you would be able to bridge those gaps in a different way. Thank you. That's very helpful about assimilation or not, or giving up a part of yourself. Uh, yeah, I, I, again, I, I don't think, uh, you know, you are who you are and you, you are as a full person. Uh, you, you, you cannot change who you are just because the company asks you to be something different. But recognize those disconnect uh, help you to bridge the gap. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is: I believe being a leader can be quite a lonely position. How would you find support to share experiences as leaders, assuming outside the specific industry? Uh, I, I think it's a very personal thing. I, I didn't feel I was lonely. I hope uh, other people didn't feel that way. Uh, I, I try, no, again, this is a different, more a style, different style. And uh, the more transparent you are, the more authentic you are, I think the more you connect with the people. One, one thing in the global business today is that when I was managing our uh, licensing business, uh, was probably, I don't remember, 25 people. 
uh, people from all over the world, from, uh, if I remember, 17 different country. Uh, it, it's a different culture background, different language, different style. You have to be very transparent because you know everybody think differently. The only way to to connect with the people is to be honest, to be transparent, and if you, if you're not sure, ask. Be humble. Ask. Uh, that that's the only way to connect with the people. Uh, if if you choose to be alone, choose to have your own style and making your own uh, <laughs> decision, that that's a, I think it's a personal choice. Not all leader has to be uh, that way. That's good news. Thank you. How do you think about or measure successful mentoring? Do you gather feedback from the people you mentored? How do you define your own success in mentoring the next generations of employees, students, and so on? Uh, I, yeah, it's a, each one is a different, but uh, I, I focus on, when I mentor people, I ask a question. I, I don't always tell them what to do, but uh, ask a question so that they really reflect, that they think about it. Uh, more likely they are gonna internalize. Uh, in the end, uh, you know, whether or not, uh, whatever they learn, it, if it's useful or not, they have to make a decision and they have to take uh, those, uh, those advices. Uh, I'm hoping some of the conversation has been useful, help them uh, progress their career, uh, but that's uh, probably not, not for me to judge whether or not it was successful or not. The fact that I'm still getting a lot of uh, people talking to me, maybe, maybe that's an indication uh, I've done it would be something useful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Xinjing. Well, you have answered all the questions and we're going to wrap up now. Is that good? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Xinjing, again. And thank you, audience. The recording of this webinar will be available on the MIT Alumni Association's YouTube channel. For the MIT community members, please join the MIT Chinese alumni group. All are welcome. You don't have to be Chinese. For the public, please link in with me and email me to be added to our email invite list. We look forward to seeing you at our September webinar on robotics, art, and architecture. Until then, thank you for coming and goodbye. Thank you, Wen Thank you, Mona. Thank you, Diane.